when you're really resolute on what your positioning is, you own a stronghold within your space to say, hey, if you need this, you can come to me. But if you don't exactly fit in line with what our perfect ideal avatar is, it's not going to make much sense for you and you're not going to get the results. So how do you turn your business into an actual brand? Well, my name is Bijal Patel and I've had 13 years of corporate experience working at big Fortune 500 companies and I'm taking all of that juicy firsthand experience and have brought it into my company launch. Within this podcast, you're going to learn about branding, vision, identity, mindset, and how to scale your business to the next level. So let's go ahead and own your brand. Okay, so how should you actually position yourself in the marketplace? So this has been an enormous learning over this last year in 2023. And as we are embarking into 2024, you want to think about how is your brand, your offer, and your sales being positioned right now in the marketplace? So I like to look at positioning from three different vantage points, and I'll get to that in just a second. But let's start with what is the definition of positioning? So positioning is, if you think about your entire industry, where exactly do you sit within that? So if you're a coach, right? If you're a fitness coach, that's a pretty broad market area. But if you're a fitness coach that serves women who are between 40 and 50 years old, who are starting to experience the signs of premenopause, and they're looking to lose about 10 to 20 vanity pounds, that is a really specific positioning. Another example of that could be, Hey, we do fractional CFO services. It's actually a client of mine right now, but he does it specifically for direct to consumer brands that are between $5 million and $20 million of revenue top line. So what that does is it takes a category that you would define as the industry and it pinpoints it down. So another way to take a look at how is your positioning is think of the TAM, which is the total addressable market. That's an entire population of people of an industry. So the best example I like to use in this is the travel industry. So you have the entire travel industry. Within that, you have the SOM, which is the serviceable, obtainable market. And within that specific, it gets a little bit tighter. Okay, so who specifically is traveling using Airbnbs? All right, so that's getting a little bit tighter. Then you go to SAM, which is the serviceable, addressable market. Now, who is Airbnbs that are within the uh, Tennessee area? Now we're getting geographic specific. So you go from bigger to smaller to smallest, and then where do you sit within that? So are you an Airbnb that caters to people who travel with um, their kids and a dog? So we have to make sure that the unit has enough bedrooms and you're potentially an entrepreneur with a laptop and there should be an area where there's an actual office that you can take your Zoom calls. Or are you more of that like kids have left the nest, you're traveling and is more for fun, you're seeing family and friends, you're doing a little bit of business on the side, but that's not the focus. Now we could be potentially high end in a condo somewhere. It's okay if there's not a dedicated office area because there's not Zoom calls that are going to be had. So understanding where your positioning is within your industry is literally the differentiator between when do people think about you. And if you remember from previous episodes, people think about you, their brand recall happens the moment they think about someone who needs your help or someone who is struggling with the pain points that you solve. So if you're clear on what that looks like, it makes so much sense for somebody to be able to raise their hand and say, yeah, me, that's me. I need help with that. If you're a brick and mortar, this is really obvious because you've got competitors that are down the street from you. They're literally down the street and you're wondering what's the difference between what you provide and what the other people provide. If you don't know the difference, then what ends up happening is you're going to compete on the bottom line thing, which is price. And this is what people call the, the, the value to the bottom. You're literally sinking and competing and you become a commodity. Instead, if you're focused on what your positioning is, you can be super different and unique. So if we were to take Tom's as a shoe company, the reason that they're different from other companies is that they're once you buy a shoe from them, they're willing to donate a pair to someone else in need. So now we're evoking the philanthropic side, the charitable side, the like, 
We love the people side and it endears a certain population of people who care about making sure as they ascend in life and as they like luxurious and quality goods because Tom's shoes are not cheap. If you want to get cheap shoes, you can go to pay less. But Tom's is while you're enjoying luxury and comfort, you're also providing that to other people. So knowing that people start to follow a brand based on what its positioning is, some of the things I want you to think about is one of the questions I ask when I'm speaking to big groups of people is, tell me how you are different from any of your other competitors. So this can mean people who you directly compete with, like let's say that you own a hair salon and you've got three hair salons down the street. Okay, those are your direct competitors for the exact same services that you offer. Another example though is indirect competitors. Let's say that you own the hair salon again, but let's say you've got a busy mom and she's decided that it's Sunday morning, she gets two hours of self-care and she has to pick. So she's going to pick between getting her hair blowed out, going to get her nails done, or going to get a massage. So now we're talking about what those indirect competitors are. When you're really resolute on what your positioning is, you own a stronghold within your space to say, hey, if you need this, you can come to me. But if you don't exactly fit in line with what our perfect ideal avatar is, it's not going to make much sense for you and you're not going to get the results. So what positioning ends up doing is it allows you to clearly and succinctly in one sentence, it's called a positioning statement, proclaim how are you different than all the landscape around you so you can stand out and to be different. So there's an interesting case study of this. The company Avis, which is a rental car company, was competing with Hertz. And Hertz was the number one in the world for rental cars. And they're trying to compete with it. Instead of saying, hey, how do we directly compete with Hertz, which would have not worked at all because they're number two, they actually went after the marketplace with the literal positioning. Hey, we're number two in terms of rental cars and the industry at large. You should have come to us because we provide a really great service and we have some of the best rates out there. But they literally proclaimed themselves as being number two and fully owned the position. And what ended up happening is the marketplace loved the reaction of how candid, how real, and how trustworthy Avis was. Because at the end of the day, imagine you're going on a trip. Let's say you're going to Sedona, like I just came from, by the way, on an amazing healing retreat that I went on. It's absolutely nuts. Highly recommend you going there. Anyways, back to this point is if you're going to go to rent a car and you're like most people, unless you are in love with a certain company and you have like a ton of points with Hertz or with Enterprise, you're not necessarily going to pick a brand favorite at that point in time. You're most likely going to be competing on a couple things, availability of the type of vehicle that you wanted to rent and then what the price was that's associated with that. So there's not usually a lot that's there. So when Avis came in and said, hey, we're number two, what happened in the mind of consumers like me and you were like, hey, well, number two is not too bad. It's just a rental car. It's not like I'm buying the car. It's not like I'm taking this car home with me. It is temporary. So they were willing to give Avis a shot to say, hey, it's okay. Hertz may not have the right vehicle or they might be more expensive or maybe the lines are even longer when I get there. I'll just go with Avis. They did proclaim that they're number two and number two is pretty good. And so they ended up winning over the marketplace by having that kind of really bold and disruptive claim to what their positioning is. So positioning, like I mentioned earlier in the podcast, I was going to talk to you about what the three different types of positioning are. So I focused a lot on what the brand's positioning is. So let's use another household example that you can think about. So imagine tissues right? I'm sure you thought of Kleenex like right off the top of your mind, right? Because we actually say tissue or Kleenex like this. There's other brands of tissues that are out there. There's the generic kind that you can get from CVS. I'm sure that there is a competitor that I literally can't think of right now because I've bought Kleenex for so many years. It doesn't matter to me. I'm sure there's a hypoallergenic brand. And then there's, you know, different brands that are like, we've got recycled content within us and we care about all the people who care about having a sustainable earth. So that becomes a category of, hey, anybody who provides tissues 
for whenever you need them in your house or for whatever you need them for. And now we have the different brands that are associated with that. Another example of this is imagine yogurts. I use this example a lot because it makes a lot of sense. You picture yogurts, we've got Greek yogurt, Icelandic yogurt, and what I better lack a better term is American yogurt. Those are three different subcategories within the category of yogurt. Now, if you go deeper into that, if you go into Icelandic yogurt, you then have the brand name Siggy's. If you go into Greek yogurt, you've got Chobani. You've got these other brands that fit underneath those subtypes. And Yoplait, which is originally an American brand, decided, no, we're going to come out specifically with a Greek version of us because we needed to fit underneath this market segment. So now you understand within this whole aisle, when you're at the grocery store, there's literally positioning that's happening there. What is our sub market? What is the sub brand that's happening in terms of categories in the mind of the shopper? And then what specific brand name is associated with that? Hey, so quick pause. Have you gotten a big piece of value from any of the episodes so far? If you have, I would absolutely love if you could share this with someone else you think could benefit from this. A principle of mine is to give it forward because that like energy creates more like energy and it'll all come back to you in the form of karma. So just want to say thanks again for listening and let's get back to the show. So if you started to think of your program, if you start to think of your services, if you start to think of what do you offer your people in that same realm, you have a better understanding of where do you fit in the landscape of your direct competitors that are within your industry and also thinking about potentially who's going to be buying from someone else, who are your indirect competitors. So let's use branding as an example. For branding, there are agencies that are directly related to branding. There are lower level people like Upwork and 99 designs, you know, people that are startups and for people who are bootlegging their business and they want to spend a few thousand bucks on a brand, they're probably going to go to somebody like that because they don't care about the strategy. Then you're going to think about somebody like Apple. When Apple got their brand redone, they spent like hundreds of thousands of dollars to redo it. And you may not appreciate and notice the subtleties in that, but they did. So the higher up the brand is, they're going to position themselves with somebody who is offering something at their level. So, you know, there's a statement that there's a, there's a customer for every level that you buy. That's exactly true. So there's a customer who will buy a hamburger from McDonald's. There's a customer who will buy a hamburger from Chick-fil-A. And there's a customer who will only buy a hamburger from like an actual restaurant. Those are three different levels of people, not saying that the restaurant person who buys a $20 or $25 burger may not once in a while buy a McDonald's burger, but they typically end up being two to three different types of clients. So when you know where you sit in terms of your brand's positioning, you're then attracting the right level client. So there is a customer for every single segment, every single level, but you have to be clear on what level are you at and have you actually communicated that? So number one, that's the brand positioning as it relates to your company at large. The second one is how does it actually relate to your offer? So within each brand, there's going to be multiple types of offer. If you are a coach or consultant, you might have the typical value ladder that you see out there. Your front-end products, then you have maybe a group coaching program or maybe you even have a course where it's all just you know do it yourself. After that, you've got some type of accountability. So it's group coaching, large groups. And then there's once in a while, there might be some calls. So you have accountability. You move up the ladder. There might be a mastermind that's higher end. So there's less people there. There's more touch points, proximities. Maybe there is events. And then on top of that, there's one-to-one. So that's a typical value ladder for a coach or consultant. So you've got all of these different types of programs that fall underneath the umbrella of the brand. So that's all of the different offerings. Each offer has a different position. So imagine for a second, I just mentioned like 99 designs and Upwork, right? As potential places people might go just to get a logo done. We don't compete with them. I never have anybody join my strategy session and say, hey, we're looking at you in Upwork because they understand as the buyer, that's not the discussion we're going to have. Upwork is going to spend, you're going to spend maybe a couple hundred bucks, a couple thousand bucks, 
and you're probably going to get a horrible looking logo, but that might be good enough for where you're bootstrapped. If you're at like 10K revenue or less a month, that might be totally fine for you. And I'm advocating, hey, if you're bootstrapped, go use one of those resources. It's totally fine. The people we serve are doing 20K of revenue or month or more, and they have grown out of their last brand. So they had a starter brand at some point in time, but they've elevated. And now when we talk about those levels, the McDonald's, the Chick-fil-A's, or like the restaurant burger, they want the restaurant burger now, and they want to come across as an attractive partner to be able to get those kind of clients in the door. That's when they come to us to say, help me understand how I can communicate with my most ideal avatar better. What is the messaging I actually need to use? How is it going to be my mission and vision and core values are going to attract the right team so that we are in the burger zone when it comes to having the right clients on board. So when you're looking at it from the offer perspective, you can align your offers differently. So when you're talking about a course, there's nothing in Upwork that you can get that's a course on branding. So those two things don't make sense anymore. So the offer positioning when it comes to a course, I'd be looking at other brand people online who also offer courses probably somewhere from 97 bucks, maybe up to like 997 or maybe 1997 that are specifically geared at helping people do a DIY course on branding. That's going to be a very different competitor to then when I compare what Brandfluencer is, which is our mastermind program and our flagship offer, that is going to compare completely differently than who I'm comparing course-wise. So each offer or each program or service that you provide also has a different positioning within it. So you want to know that at that level of granularity. The final piece I want to hit on is the positioning carries into your sales calls. So if you are doing sales calls, if you're still getting on strategy sessions or you're doing audits or having consultations, any of those kind of things, even if you're selling from stage, recently what I've been learning and I'm deploying is like having our own events, which by the way, we're having our next brand intensive. It's going to be February 1st and 2nd in Houston, Texas. It is not going to be at my house this time. So sorry, we will have a party here, but it's going to be absolutely amazing. If you want those details, drop winter intensive into the comments and somebody on my team will get you that information over. So pumped about that. But back to what I was saying about sales. When it comes to sales, when you open up the call, you want to position yourself as the leading expert of what is the person going to get by investing their time by being on the call. So Sales is just a conversation. Sales is not an opportunity for you to pitch because you first have to actually vet the person and say, does this client and prospect actually fit in line with who should be a part of my client roster? So you want to think about that from a brand perspective because who your clients are are a reputation and they are a reflection of the reputation that your brand carries. So I think a lot of times people are like, well, how do I find the right clients? How do I get the client to want to buy in with me? But it's not getting someone to do something with you. It's more about how are you representing yourself so you're attracting, inviting the right people to come work with you. So when you're opening up your sales call, you're positioning yourself to say, hey, for example, you know, we're, this isn't going to be a typical call. You might be expecting that we're going to go through all your logos and colors and stuff like that. And we can, if that's really important to you. But what I would much prefer if you're on board is that we actually go through your strategy. Let's go check out your website or your so main social media profile. And let me go in there and just audit and hack where your messaging might be off with your avatar. Because now through this process, I'm going to get a better understanding of exactly what you offer, where you'd like to be, and where potentially the gaps could be. Do you think that that would be a better use of our time? Boom. Yes. They're going to say yes. Any single human would be like, yes. Can I get more of that, please? Actual value during a sales conversation. So that's how you position things. So you're already helping invite the person on the call to say, this is going to be advantageous for you because you are going to learn and get value from me. And it's even better than consuming any free content because that information is now individualized down to their exact nuanced 
scenario. So a lot of the reason courses and things aren't hitting as well as they did before in 2023 and 2022, the world of information is there. People are really well educated. I bet you are just like me. You've consumed so much stuff. It's great. You're really smart. You can spit it out. All the business facts, all the brand facts, marketing, sales, you know all the tricks. The thing is though, how is that information getting individualized and customized down to your brand? So that's what you want to go after your positioning. So I hope this podcast helped you get really detailed on the three things related to your positioning, brand positioning, offer positioning, sales positioning, and can you clearly communicate that in one sentence that hits, it really punches, and it is unforgettable. I hope you liked today's episode and you got real value that you can apply into your business right away. If you did, I'd be so immensely grateful if you wouldn't mind subscribing, leaving a review, sharing with a friend, whatever makes sense to you, and I will catch you on the next one.